Welcome to Video Chapel at Gateway Seminary. It's my pleasure to welcome you once again to this special chapel experience. Before I introduce our chapel speaker, let me comment about several special events taking place at Gateway. First of all, on Monday, November 2nd, we're hosting an event entitled Jonathan Edwards in Slavery, Christian Leadership with Feet of Clay. This will be a digital panel discussion on the legacy of Jonathan Edwards, specifically examining the issue of slavery in early American history and how modern readers ought to interact with those views today. You can watch this panel discussion on our website, gs.edu backslash jec, or on our YouTube channel. Then on Thursday, November 5th, will be our Intersect Conference. Mark DeMoz will be speaking on building multicultural leadership teams. This is a digital event featuring two back-to-back -back sessions with question and answer times between or after each one. This event is free and requires no registration. Just join us on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. We're excited to have these two great virtual events next week. And if you need help with this information, just hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel and that'll help you find the additional information you need. Commencement this winter will be held on campus in Ontario on December 12th. You can join us by watching the live stream as we recognize and celebrate Gateway graduates. This will not be a public event, but you're certainly welcome to join us online. Let me also remind you about the Enduring Faith Conference. It's launching on January 30th and will be available to access until May 31st. The conference this year will feature over 20 video sessions designed to encourage and train Bible study teachers. You can register your church on the Gateway website or on Eventbrite. Individuals who want to sign up should contact the Office of Advancement Services. Now our speaker for this week. Our speaker is no stranger to the Gateway community. Dr. Leroy Ganey has been teaching at Gateway Seminary for over 30 years. Although he recently retired, he's still currently serving with us as Senior Professor of Educational Leadership. He brings a lifetime of pastoral experience in the Bay Area, upstate New York, and New Jersey to his teaching role. For 26 years, he pastored First Baptist Church in Vacaville, California, where he led a multicultural congregation renowned for its ministry to the local community. You can learn more about Dr. Ganey's experience as a minister and teacher in the upcoming fall edition of the Gateway Magazine, which will feature stories about him. His message today looks at Revelation chapter 3. The Apostle John wrote Revelation from prison in a time when churches across Asia Minor were suffering immense persecution for their faith. Through this letter, Jesus showed the early church that the fight against Satan was far from over and they must not lose hope. Dr. Ganey encourages us to continue the work of evangelism and build strong churches that Satan can never defeat. Let's hear Dr. Leroy Ganey. I, um told that we were running a little ahead of time, and they were looking for me. I was lost, but now I'm found. You know, since we've, we've got a few minutes, and I don't have to, to rush, and I do want to bring you a word, I want, I want to teach you a little song. And I've, I've taught this song all over the United States. That's how important it is to me. I first went to the church that I just retired from in Vacaville. There was a group that came. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to date myself here, but how many of you re remember the song, Up on the Roof? Up on the Roof. Anyway, the, the guy who, who penned that song got saved, and he started a, a ministry in uh, Sacramento, which is about 35 miles from where the town was, where I was pastoring, and he brought a group of young people down. And there was a young woman, she was about 17 years old, that was with the group, and she had been living on the streets and, of course, uh, making her way as best she could by living on the streets and doing what street people do. But she had now gotten saved, and God was using her in a mighty way. And for 26 years... I don't know her name. I don't know anything more about her than what I'm telling you. But she left this song with me, and I want to I teach it to you real quick. It's called Don't Give Up. Now, why, why am I singing this to you? Because it never, never uh, 
behooves me that in meetings like this, somebody comes and they feel like giving up. Somebody's going through some things, either in their church or in their marriage, where, where it's not so good. And this is a mountaintop experience. We're in a mountaintop place. It's an evangelism conference, but, but somebody hasn't been able to get with it so well just yet because they still have whatever's going on in their lives at the forefront of their thoughts. And this is for those folk. And if it's not you, then you pray for those uh, individuals who may be you because regardless of who we are and how well we're doing right now, life is like this. And it may be up today and it'll be down tomorrow. It may be up two days, but it'll be down tomorrow. It may not be you today. It's somebody else, but tomorrow your turn will come. And the song goes like this. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. Don't give up. Someone really cares. Don't give up, someone really loves you, and that someone is the Lord. Kind of simple, right? All right, well, why don't we try it <clears throat> before I take it to the second verse. And that's, it's simple also, but don't give up, someone really loves you. Don't give up, someone really cares. Don't give up, someone really loves you. And that someone is the Lord. Now here's the second verse, and it's the very same, same beat. It says, keep the faith, someone really loves you. Keep the faith, you got it? Someone really cares. Now do me a favor, look at the person next to you and tell them. Keep the faith, someone really loves you. And that someone is the Lord. Now come back to the first verse and continue looking at the person. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. Don't give up. Someone really cares. Don't give up. Someone really loves you, and that someone is the Lord, and that someone is the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the whole evangelism conference. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me an opportunity to be here and share from your word. And now, Lord, I ask if there be anything about me that would keep your people from seeing you, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross because there's nothing about me that's worth anything. There's nothing about me that is worth being glorified. There's nothing about me of any honor. But, Lord, you are worthy of it all. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, and I'm, I'm not a big fight fan, but I just happened to see this fight. It was billed as being the fight of the century. And the fight was between uh, one of the most feared pugilists in all of the land by the name of Iron Mike Tyson. And I see some of you shaking your head. I still can remember him. <laughs> and he was fighting against 
an individual whose name was Evander Holyfield. And Tyson had knocked out so many individuals in the first round that it was said that Evander would not be able to stand up under the onslaught of this mighty uh, fighter, this mighty man of, of martial arts and boxing. And so people were saying that it really wasn't going to be much of a fight. It was going to be over before it even got started very well. Anyway, <clears throat> they went into the ring and they started fighting and an amazing thing happened and that is that Evander Holyfield didn't show any fear of Mike Tyson and he also was looking like he was winning the fight. He was so much looking like he was winning the fight that Mike Tyson took a bite out of his air. You remember that, right? I'm not making this up. I'd never seen it before. He took, he took a bite out of his hair, and then they let the fight continue. Then he took another bite out of his hair. He was so frustrated that he had run up against an opponent that he could not handle. He had run up against somebody who did not fear him. He had run up against somebody who was more than his equal, and it caused him to lash out in a way that no boxer should ever do, and the fight was disqualified. I want to preach to you tonight from this subject. The evangelistic church that hell can't handle. The evangelistic church that hell can't handle. The Word of God says these words in the sixth and the seventh verses. It says that whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus had come to visit with his disciple John, who was in prison because he couldn't keep his mouth quiet. He couldn't keep quiet about Jesus, and so he's actually in jail, not because he is a serial killer, not because he has stolen anything, not because he was such a bad person, but when he was in jail because of his testimony about Jesus Christ. And Jesus visits him in a spiritual form. It says that he had hair white like sheep's wool, eyes like burning fire, feet like uh, uh, brass and a voice like many waters. And he tells him almost a repeat of these words here, of which he says to the church at Philadelphia, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Just prior to that, when Jesus first talked to John, he put his hand on him. I imagine it was on his shoulder, and it says that John bows down before him. Could you imagine what that must have been like? Here he is all alone, a prisoner on the island of Patmos, there out in the middle of the sea, no one to talk to, no one who understood his testimony, no one who understood why he was really in jail. And here, Jesus shows up. Have you ever been there before? Where it seems like the dark hour had come over you. When it seemed like you were in a place where there was no answers. When it seemed like you were in a place where there was no way out. And Jesus comes to your situation. And he puts his hand on you. And he says, look, I've got a job for you. I know that you are in jail. I know that you are in prison because of your testimony money for me, but you are the one who I want to write a letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And I want you to tell them about the things that are to come. I want you to write a letter to Ephesus, and I want you to write a letter to Smyrna, and I want you to write a letter 
to Thyatira, and I want you to write a letter to Pergamon. I want you to write a letter to Philadelphia. I want you to write a letter to Sardis, and I want you to write a letter to Laodicea, and I want you to tell them that no matter how bad things look, the battle's not over until I say it's over. I'm the door opener, and I am the door shutter. I imagine John must have been overwhelmed with, you know what, if there was somebody he could have talked to right there, he said, you know, I knew he was right. I knew that I was right the whole while, that he wasn't going to leave me here, that I wasn't going to be all alone, that God always keeps his promise. Every one of those churches that he wrote, except for Smyrna and Philadelphia, and Smyrna only says a few words about it. He says something good, and then he says something bad. But to the church at Philadelphia, and all of these churches, I believe, were very essential in how the gospel got continued after the time of Jesus' crucifixion, and even after the time of John on the island of Patmos, that it was little churches like these, house churches, that continue to take the word out into the world. In California, I don't know about New Mexico, but churches are closing up all around us, and I'm not just talking about Southern Baptist churches. Because of the atmosphere and the culture that is so much against Christianity today. Many are closing up their doors. People are not joining. People don't want to be a part. And so the churches have thrown in the towel. They have closed the doors. Even some have put up for sale signs. This is a very pitiful sight to see because if there's anything that should be standing in the toughest of times, in the challenging of times, in the worst of times, in the darkest of times, it needs to be the church. I believe that God gives us a glimpse of the kind of church that hell can't handle when he spoke to the church at Philadelphia. The word philos means brotherly love, love between uh, people in a friendship way, that this was the church of love. This is the church that could overcome anything because of the love of God. I believe that we get a glimpse of how we can become the church that hell can't handle. Does anybody want to see that tonight? Does anybody want to know about that tonight? All right, I'm hearing you say that you want to know about it, and I'm hearing you say that you want to see it. Does anybody want to do something about it? All right, then. Let's see what the Word of God says. The first one is, and I want you to make it a prayer, because I just heard you say that I want to do something about it. Here's the prayer, and there's three prayers that I find in this text where God says that he will make. Christ, make me see opposition to your evangelistic work as an opportunity. Make me see opposition as an opportunity to join you in the work. Make me see, help me to see with these eyes, Lord, where I can lock arms with you and make a difference in my community. No matter how bad it is, no matter how tough it is, no matter what's going on, Lord, make me see the opportunity and not the opposition. The Word of God says it this way in 3.8. He says to the church of Philadelphia, he says, I know your deeds. In other words, I know you've been working. I know you've not given up. I know that you've been steadfast. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I know that you're not a mega church. I know that you're not even a big church, but you kept on working. You kept on going. You hung on in there when things got tough. And I want you to know something. I know why you did. Let's go back to our verse. You kept on going because you saw the open door 
that I have placed before you. How many of you see the open door that God has placed before you? How many of you have seen his open door right in your community? They may not be the same color as you are. They may not be the same language group as you are. They may not even come from the same culture as you are. But you see, that's the open door for God for us. Wherever there are people, that's an open door. Too many times, God sends us somebody that doesn't look like us. Doesn't sound like us, don't eat what we like to eat. And we look at that as being opposition. And then we run away. We run to the suburbs or some other kind of burbs somewhere. Don't you know that Satan knows where Omaha is? Don't you know that darkness knows where those places are where there may not be urban dwellers? Our kids are on drugs out in those places. Those gangs now are out in those places. All of the bad stuff that we have run away from, all of the darkness that we have run away from has now caught us. When will we stop and say, this is not an opposition, this is an opportunity for me to share the good news about Jesus Christ I'm reminded about John in his gospel, same John that is here on the island of Patmos, where a woman, a Samaritan woman, came to Jacob's well there at Sychar in Galilee, or when Jesus was on his way to Galilee. And Jesus is sitting there waiting. And Jesus asked her for a drink of water. And her response to her, to him was, you know, Jews don't drink behind us. In other words, you're a different race than we are. You're a different culture than we are. Don't you know that we don't, we don't mix? And Jesus said that if you just knew who I am, if you just knew who it was who was offering you this water, you'd say, that's living water. And you'd drink it. The woman, obviously, because it was midday, or at least it was thought that she was coming from a very dark background, and that maybe her past wasn't so good, and maybe she wasn't involved in uh, some good things and involved in some shady things. And so she wants to know when we have that living water so I don't have to come back out to this well at 12 o'clock in the heat of the day. And Jesus changes the subject. Jesus says, where's your husband? Go and get your husband, bring your husband back here. I want to talk to him too. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, and you know Jesus knows everything. You've had f five, five, no, five <laughs> husbands. And the one you're with now, you're shagging up. Amen? And so you have to wonder, why does Jesus move from the water to this subject of the husbands? And this is what I surmise, and I think it's very clear, that you don't go through five husbands unless you're looking for something that you didn't find in the first one. She was looking for something that was greater than what any human being could give her, that was greater than any man could give her. It was greater than any kind of person could have given her. It was so great that we call it purpose. We call it identity. You see, the only person who can give you your purpose in life is God Almighty himself. You can't get it from the president. 
You can't get it from a government program. You can't get it from nowhere but from God himself. And he said, you know what, woman? Yes, your situation is bad. Yes, your situation needs some tweaking. But let me tell you, you are not a wasted case. I can fix you. For you see, I am he who you've been looking for. I will give you the identity and the purpose that you need in life. You know, there's not a person in here who has not been seeking the very same thing that that woman was seeking. Maybe you didn't go through five husbands or five wives, but every one of us needed to have questions answered in our lives. Who am I? Where did I come from? What, what can I do? Where am I going to go when I die? And let me tell you, nobody can answer that question but Jesus Christ. The disciples come back, and the woman, the Bible says that the woman dropped her bucket. She wasn't even concerned about the water anymore. She dropped her bucket, and she ran back to town to the very man who probably put her down, to the very man who talked about her, to the very man who probably scandalized her, to the very man who laughed at her. She went back, and she evangelized them. And the Bible says that they went to where Jesus was. And they stayed there with him two or three days. And when it was all over with, they said, you know what? Now we believe. She took the opportunity to tell us. And now we believe, not just because of what she said, but because of what you say. I'm saying to you, and each and every one of us, as we represent churches that are in this New Mexico Baptist Convention, that you have a great opportunity of sharing the word together. And that no matter what challenges you go through, no matter what hardships you go through, if one of you go through it, then all of you go through it. And know that you want a team and that God has a purpose, and that is to use you. Take your opportunity, and don't, let, don't leave anything on the table. God wants to use you. Anybody know what that is? That's a happy meal, right? Let me tell you, if you were real hungry, is that what you'd think about? No, you wouldn't think about that. Yeah, you, 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 that, that would never come to your mind, and most of you are mature. I know you are mature. You know that that's not going to fill you up, and not only that, a, a, a young child doesn't realize it, but they'll never grow to their potential eating French fries and ice cream. You've got to eat something else if you want to grow to your potential, and not only that, you know, the devil is, is, is really amazing. He'll put a little... Um, I put a little toy in there to make you think that you're getting more uh, uh, in, this, in this thing. And, and life is like that, where you keep on eating stuff that will not grow you, that will not allow you to see God's vision, that will actually block God's vision. The Bible says, you know, you ought to be old enough to start eating meat. Now you're really getting on some good stuff right here. Now, actually, I am not encouraging you to, <laughs> to, to eat like this. But what I'm saying is, is that this is the meat. Am I making sense? That if you want to see the impossible, if you want to hear God's word afresh to you, then you need to eat the meat each and every day. My God will supply all of your needs if you are, if you are in Christ Jesus. You know, I, 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 my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. I'll make a way for you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You see, when you have been eating the nutritious word of God, you will see possibilities that you have not seen before. Can I get a witness here? Number two, 
Well, the first one again, Christ, make me see those oppositions to your evangelistic work, evangelistic work as opportunities for me to get closer to you. Number two, make me a spiritual fighter. Make me a spiritual fighter. One of the things that we have to do, and that is to expect that the greatest thing that the church can do today is reach people, that it's going to take a fight, that it's not going to come easy, and it's going to cause us to have to exert some energy that perhaps we have not been doing before. Our budgets can no longer be in evangelism and outreach, the smallest thing on the, on, on the budget sheet annually. That ought to be the biggest budget where people are going out and they're making a difference instead of looking for everything to come in, but that I'm sending people out and they are telling people about the word of God and about Jesus Christ. And we support it with our finances. We support it with our time. We support it with our energy. We support it with our talents. We support it and we are a church that is evangelistic and we demonstrate it. It's going to take a fight. I don't mean this kind of fight. Well, excuse me, hold, hold my, I got a picture here. But he says, uh, John, he says to John, he says, I will make you, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they're not but are lies, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. You're going to run into challenges. You're going, to run, you're going to run into people not only on the outside of the church, but you're going to run into people on the inside of the church that is not going to see evangelism as being the most important thing that you do. You're not going to see the majority of the people there. But I'm still saying that it is the most important thing that God tells us to do. It is the point for his mission. I grew up. In the Bronx, New York, and in the Bronx, New York, you had to learn how to hold your hands. It meant that you had to learn how to fight early on. I was never really good at fighting. And so I had to learn other things and, and, and to help me, but I've also come to understand that fighting is important for life and it is important to the work of God. We have to learn how to fight. You, you don't fight like this. That, that's not how you fight. Not, not, as, not as a Christian, that, that's not how you fight. Because, see, you'll raise that up, and you'll even become worse. <laughs> you, you see, now you're, we're fighting with weapons. That's not how you fight. This is how we fight. This is how we fight. We fight with love. Am I making sense to you? That we love folk to death through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I not only love you to death... I believe that God will fight my battles. I don't have time to fight against all of those folks who are against me, that don't like me because I'm uh, standing for Jesus Christ. I don't have time to get into battles with them, but God has promised that he will fight my battles. My job is to promote the gospel, to promote the word of God. Let me show you something else here. Those are the cutest things, aren't they? And I, I like German Shepherds. I don't own one, and I've never owned one, but I'm no fool. If somebody gave me uh, some German Shepherd puppies, I'd know that they have the potential of, of becoming something. But if I didn't train them to do something, this is what I'd get. <laughs> you know, the only thing that those dogs can do is stand around and look cool. Hey, let me tell you what, that looks like some churches I go into. Am I making sense to you? That as a Christian, God has called me to fight, but to fight with my gifts and my talents. If you're a preacher, then preach. If you're a teacher, then teach. If you're a counselor, then counsel. If you're a leader, then lead. Whatever it is that God has given you, then you use that. Get the training and use that to fight. Hey, look at this dog here. This dog has learned how to fight disasters. That's a disaster release dog. He didn't just get that way. Somebody had to train him to do that. This dog is a police dog. He fights what? 
He fights crime. He didn't just get that way. He had to be trained to do that. This dog is a military dog. Am I making, is it getting through to you that through the training of my gifts and my talents, I am called to go out and to fight the darkness of this world? I like what it says in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. We take captive every thought that is not according to the knowledge of the word of God. And when we take that captive, when we take those people captive, let me tell you what happens. (laughs) Hey, we get dogs who train other dogs. That's right. That's a very useful dog right there, as a matter of fact. Because this dog was probably one of the dogs that had the eyeglasses on. But now, he's a trainer. How many of you Has it happened to you like that? Somebody took the time to invest in you. Somebody took the time to teach you how to fight using your gifts and your talents. Not to be a pugilist, not to be a Mike Tyson, but to use God's word to turn this world back around to him. Hey, there's nothing that is more powerful than to see God's word come out of your mouth and go into darkness and see some grown man, see some grown woman, somebody who was raising hell somewhere else who is now down on their knees and saying, I believe in all my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, that's worth fighting for. And if it's not worth fighting for, then none of this is worth fighting for. I look at those dogs, and I'm reminded of a saying, and the saying is, it's not the dog in the fight, it's the fight in the dog. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and my understanding of Scripture is that no weapon formed against me can prosper. Greater is he that is where? In me than he that is in the world. I don't have any reason to give up. I don't have any reason to throw in the towel. I don't have any reason to stop going for it. I'll go until the day I die. Why is that? Because I am a part of the church that hell cannot handle. That's the part I am. And that's the part where I'll die. Last one. Christ, make me a pillar in your temple. There are two types of pillars when we think about pillars. Before I go to my verse, there are two types of pillars. One pillar is the pillar that holds up things. They, they, they support things. And that's not the pillar that, that, that we're going to be reading about here. I've seen some pillars in some churches And actually, God doesn't need you to hold him up. (laughs) He's he's the baddest dude on the planet. (laughs) He doesn't need you to to hold him up. And for some of us, when we think that we're holding up the church, or we give the most money, or we're the smartest, we begin to feel as if everything's got to run through us. And so we, we don't want things to happen, and so we hold it up. We, 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 we stop things, and, 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 and what we need to do is to stop holding up stuff and get out of the way. My first church, not Helen, Georgia, but another place in Georgia, I never will forget it. There was three people in church, and that was a lot of folk. Seemed like it was a crowd because they made a lot of noise at those three, three folks. And I'll never forget, I, had, I was a new pastor, and I wanted to get them to move to a, a place where there was more people because we were way back in the woods. And I'll never forget, we, went, we had a business meeting, and 15 people showed up. I don't know why people show up for business meeting. They don't show up for it. Anyway, I was 
looking for someone to make a motion. I'd given my plan about us moving the church to where there were more people so that we could be a testimony in that place. And I'll never forget, there was a, an elderly gentleman in the church, and his name was Deacon Brown. And he, he stood up and he said, I, I, I motion that we don't move nowhere. And my heart just sunk down into my stomach. He said, I motion that we don't move anywhere because you see, I was saved right here on this pew, right here by this post, right here, right here by this pillar. And there was another little lady in the church, and I, I'll never forget her because she used to wear these hats that had, you remember with the fruit on them? They weren't real fruit, but being out, just out of seminary, I was always hungry. And every time I'd, I'd see that hat on her, I'd want to pull me off one of those apples or, or grapes on there. And I remember her standing up, and I'm saying to myself, you know what? This is not going to fly. I'm going to get another person who's going to second the motion, and we're not going to move anywhere. And I'll never forget her standing up and saying, Brother Pastor, Brother Pastor, I'd like to make a motion to, I'd like to amend the motion. I said, okay, we'll amend the motion. I amend the motion. Let's give Deacon Brown that pew and that pillar that he was saved on, and let's move on. <laughs> God doesn't need that kind of pillar, but God needs monuments. And let me tell you, the monument is not the most important thing. Here is the most important thing. I am coming soon, Jesus says to John. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. You see, the best is has come yet. I haven't given the final word yet on you. I haven't said my good and faithful servant yet. Don't give up yet. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. Here's the most important thing. You're going to get branded. You're going to wear his brand. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Is there anything that will mean more to this next generation than for you and for you and for you and for you and for me to be the pillars of God's church? Not with your name on it, not with your name on it, not with my name on it, but with Jesus' name on it. No greater statement that I wear the brand of Jesus Christ. I wear the designer clothing of Jesus Christ. I am a part of his temple, the living God. You know, the beautiful thing when I think about his name being on all of the, of all of the pillars, that you're a different color pillar than I am, and I'm a different color pillar than you are, and this one is a different color pillar than that. The one that makes it, the thing that makes us all the same is that we all have the same name on us. You see, it's not that I look like you and that you look like me, but what makes us different than the world is that we have the name of Jesus. I want to close by saying this before I move on here. In math class, I'll never forget, I had the hardest time with fractions. Anybody here had a hard time with fractions? I had a hard time with fractions. And I couldn't get it. I got it now, but I couldn't get it then. That the only way you can add fractions is you've got to have the same number on the bottom. You, you remember that? What was that called? The common denominator. You can have a different, what was the top number called? The numerator. You can have a different numerator. The numerators didn't have to be the same. You see, the numerators represent you and I. The denominator represents Jesus Christ. The pillars will be all different colors. We'll come from all different backgrounds. We'll speak all different languages. 
But the common denominator will be that we have the branding of Jesus Christ on us. You know, what's at stake? I believe this is at stake. And let me tell you what, that's not funny. Because those kids, I would imagine, they're probably three or four, and, and maybe the parents who posted this picture, I got it right off of, of uh, the, the internet, they wear the colors. Am I making sense to you? You know, there's one thing about Satan. He doesn't care how young he gets. He doesn't care how young he brings the darkness. I'm saying to you, We've got to care. If your family is not worth fighting for, if your communities is not worth fighting for, if this next generation is not worth fighting for, you'll never be the church that hell can't handle. How many of you in here is this generation, this next generation worth fighting for? Let me see you stand to your feet if you really do believe that, that it's worth me fighting for. You see, there is nothing, there is nothing that is worth anything in this world that I am not going to have to fight for. I make a commitment today to take the Word of God to the darkest place He'll send me. Don't, tell me, don't send me to the easy places. Send me to the darkest places, Lord. And I promise you this time, I'll be the church that hell can't handle. Come on and say these points with me now. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the churches are who? Us. What does he say? Christ, make me see opposition to your evangelistic work as an opportunity. Christ, make me a spiritual fighter. Christ, make me a pillar. Your name, not my name. My name's not important. Your name. The evangelistic church that hell can't handle. I can't finish that part for you, but I can finish it for me. Lord, make me that kind of church.